Okay, who's out there in chat land? Shizrock! Shizrock! Oh! What is it going on here? What do you mean that Minis Paint Show's on here? Hold on a second. Let me get that fixed right away. I can't believe that's doing that. What happened there? I know I just didn't update that. Oh, I forgot to hit done. Boom. Stream, stream info has been updated, my friend. Sorry about that, Shizrock. Hang out, man. You're going to find some cool stuff. God with my bar stool. <laughs> you always have good funny things to say. What do we got going on, guys? Wizard of DC, it is time for happy hour. And if you're in DC, you know that happy hour is a national sport here. <laughs> well, it should be fixed now. If you hit review, it should say the game's having happy hour. Uh, it should be good to go. Let's see what we got going on here. We got about a minute before we go live. Ah, that's the spirit. Gotta enjoy that ale. Gotta, gotta, gotta. I'm going to be running a lot of solo tonight so I could use all the energy and chat I could get. Until we get to the interview. And then we've got some amazing folks coming on here. to have you on buddy one inch heroes oh everybody's on today this is going to be a hot episode today rock troll from reaper feel like that calls for a malbec yeah trolls are classy no they're not they're absolutely filthy disgusting animals looks like we got some more folks pouring in here it looks like we're going to get a good start today Nix is on. We've got some great guys from Shard Tabletop coming in tonight. We've got a shorter news segment for new releases. Some stuff on miniatures for sure. Excited to see all of you guys in our chat tonight. Let's see what we can get going on here in three, two, one.
Hey, oh, we're live. Welcome to the Games Tavern Happy Hour. Excited to see everybody in chat tonight. Got an exciting episode today. Uh, we got some really awesome folks that we're going to be interviewing. And uh, oh, hey, oh, Duramora, good to see you. Uh, some really awesome folks we're going to be talking to during the interview. We got Hal and Darren both from Shard Tabletop. Uh, they've got some pretty cool announcements to make tonight, as well as just all sorts of other cool things. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is where a bunch of us nerds get together and talk about tabletop gaming news, reviews, and interviews with those in the tabletop gaming space. For those of you who are normally watching our show, my co-host Jeff is is off tonight, and my other co-host Rob is also unable to attend. But uh, we're glad to have you join us for this show and help pack the house a little bit. Uh, again, as I've mentioned before, we're, we've got an interview with Hal and Darren, the geniuses behind Shard Tabletop, each with a long history in tabletop games. And also, as usual, when we get started here, the latest new releases and news uh, discussion as well. If this is your first time watching the Games Tavern Happy Hour, well, welcome. Please don't forget to follow us on Twitch. It's free and supports the show. If you have uh, Amazon Prime, then you have a free Prime Gaming subscription. We'd really appreciate it if you'd consider using that free Prime and Games Gaming subscription here at the Games Tavern to support all of the great shows and content uh, the rest of the week as well. So please. And then also subs get access to special sub only emotes as well as a special channel on the Games Tavern Discord where you get to ask us questions directly. Uh, let's see here. Uh, remember, you can also watch this Li uh, not live, but you can also watch this approximately 48 hours later, and then the interviews get spliced off into a special interview-only playlist uh, on YouTube. Uh, so check it out there as well. So if you haven't checked this out on YouTube, definitely do so. I'm going to drop that link in chat for you guys. Boom. So also, if you folks see something really cool, I'm going to go a little bit slow on it so you guys get some time to ask questions, make comments, tell me what you think of the things that we're doing. If you have a big question, be sure and type QUESTION in all caps uh, so that we can see it quickly. I'm trying to juggle a lot here. Uh, even my tech crew is off today, so it's been a real challenge. Uh, let's see here. So tonight we're also going to be giving away an epic character generator from um, Overhead Games. Uh, that just got kicked off right now, and that'll be uh, the drawing will, will complete at the end of the show. So be sure and check them out. They make amazing uh, graphical tools that let you make your own character avatar generator and for your games. So you can make characters, bad guys. You may have seen some of the stuff we did recently on uh, uh, 12 Nights in Barovia. We made a few uh, I, uh, characters that showed up in that. And we'll be seeing some more of that stuff as well. So check it out. Uh, cast and crew of the Games Tavern are not eligible to take part. You must be a follower to enter, and you must be present in chat to uh, for staff to contact you to present the prize to the winner. So be sure and be here when that goes off. All right. Let's see here. Duramora, already already got good going, man. All these guys are, are registering to win. Awesome, awesome. So with that, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys what you guys have been gaming on this week. Uh, I personally have been doing some stuff with Storm King's Thunder with a private game with a great group of folks on the Games Tavern Discord. And then I've also been doing a lot of stuff and reading a lot of stuff in Eberron lately. And I, I, I won't tell anybody why, but something cool is coming. So let's see here. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, anybody else doing anything cool this week in gaming? Yes, no, maybe. All right. Long, slow pause. <laughs> All right, lot, double exclamation marks. I see that, too. All righty. Here we go. Well, with that, we're going to... You guys can always kick it in, in at any time and let me know what you're doing. I'd love to hear it. Uh, ran an adventure for your wife. First time she placed, played D&D. &D. Oh! Another guy's doing a... Uh, Shizrock's doing a home game in Wildmount. Scaring the pants off your friends in Call of Cthulhu. You know, they need to get tighter pants. That's all I'm saying. Duramora, all I'm doing is starting to sketch out a one-shot, M-shot, possible campaign. W which is it, Dura? And then Shizrak, we play once once per quarter, once every three months. That's a challenging game. That's that's uh, that's rough. How do you, how do you keep the, the action co consistent and to remember what you're doing between each session? Yeah. <laughs> 
at your speed, they'll be playing it in two years, Derek. You guys rock. You guys rock. All right. Tighter pants. You see? See? Everybody's laughing at that. You got to love that tighter pants comment. All right. So with that, we're going to kind of get started with the news here. So let's see what we got. All right, so our news has kicked off. So with that, let's get started. For many of you Dungeons and Dragons players, you're familiar with the tabletop game. Some of you may have played Baldur's Gate 3 or the Neverwinter Nights series on PC. But what they've also recently done uh, since our last show is the Dark Alliance pre-orders are now open. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Dark Alliance, this is a, in many ways, first of its kind let me drop that in chat so you guys see the link. First of its kind, um, four-player melee uh, PvP or PvE game. Not PV, not PvP, but uh, multiplayer. Uh, it's not like a. It's kind of like a first-person shooter, but you can team up with your friends. But there's a lot of melee, so uh, you band together with your friends from all over the world, and you can fight vicious monsters in a co-op action RPG from Dungeons and Dragons. So. You can play as one of four unforgettable heroes and fight for the future of your homeland. So these are the heroes that uh, you may be familiar with from the Dritz Jordan series. You can play Dritz and you can play three of his companions that he's, he's spent a lot of time with. Um, you've got two options available for the pre-order. There is the Dark Alliance Standard Edition pre-order bundle, which comes with the Dark Alliance game. And it comes with a, I, I guess you can get certain uh, upgrades or... Um, if they're not upgrades, they're called vanity items. So there's a beholder weapon set. Characters in your party wield a beholder themed scimitar, bow, axe, or hammer. Um, so everyone in here gets a themed um, weapon set, potentially. Then there's the Dark Alliance Digital Deluxe Edition. It comes with the Dark Alliance game. It comes with the beholder weapon set. It comes with a lich weapon set, where the characters can wield a lich themed scimitar, bow, axe, or hammer. And it also comes with the Echoes of Blood War, uh, Echoes of the Blood War expansion content. This is some cool stuff. Um, most people like these vanity items, and in some cases, maybe these are better items. I don't know. But if you pre-order, you get them, and it's a great way to get some cool content as well. I've seen a lot of the graphic play for this game. I've been nothing but impressed with it constantly. It's. Uh, there's even some really cool team themed moves where two players can work together to do like a, a team move. Um, however, it, it's not ready yet. It's coming uh, supposedly this June. So, I mean, I say supposedly only because you know how sometimes dates and times can get uh, reworked and, and crazy stuff like that can happen. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this and the Dritz Jordan novels, highly recommend you check them out because there's a dwarf uh, there's uh, a rogue, there's a, a barbarian, and then there's, of course, Dritzt. There's not a lot of magic in this, to be honest, uh, which is kind of surprising in terms of there's no spellcasters and stuff, and at the same time, probably makes sense for this particular type of game. Um, AARPG, but sounds like someone's game pitch. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, but D&D sounds like someone's game pitch. Yeah, it, it does, kind of, doesn't it? But it's, it's really interesting to see how some of this stuff is, is going to go. I, I wonder if later on they're going to expand and add additional character choices like they've done with some of the other games. Uh, or if they're going to create um, opportunities to, well, I don't know, uh, add magic or more magic items or magical effects. Any of which would be pretty cool if they could do that. Um, let's see here. Uh... What I do? What other questions we have in chat here right now? Dark Alliance bringing back the PS2 magic. Oh, was there a Dark Alliance in PS2? Did they do that in PS2? That's interesting. Tell me more about that. Yup, yup. Okay, yup, yup isn't telling me much more about it. So tell me all about it. <laughs>
Similar format. Okay. No. Duramora, good question. Any comparison between Dark Alliance and Baldur's Gate 3? No. No difference. Um, this is a hack and slash. So try to imagine, um, uh, let's see here, Dura, you're, you, you might remember Doom. You might remember, you know, Battlefield. Any of those first-person shooter games, except there's a whole lot less shooting and a whole lot more up close and personal uh, hack and slash. So that's the kinds of things that you're going to see a lot more of on a consistent basis with this stuff. So um, let's see here. Um, okay. Let's see what else we can, we can pull in here. All right. So next up, uh, more like Gauntlet, but more complex. Um, <laughs> no. Oh, 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 the, the original was like Gauntlet. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you can see some of the video from this, um, I tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll do something real quick. We'll, we'll try to show some video for this in a little bit. So hang in there. We'll get some video up. Uh, let me see what I can do about that. Uh, give me one second, folks. We're going we're gonna to do this magic here. Um, we'll do it live because that's what we do here. I think this is this is something that uh, some folks are going to want to see, and uh, I'm going to make it where you guys can see the preview um, of what we got here. Um, let's see here. Let me pull up that cool thing. Yeah, that'll do her. Boom. Where is it? Why can I not see it? It's interesting. It doesn't want to show it to me here. Hmm. Uh, let me see here. We call them beholders. No, 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 no. Hold on one second, folks. Let me pull this up in the YouTubes. Let me get a full screen we on that. We call them beholders. Let me get a real full screen on that. Let me see if I can't get this to pull up here. It does not want to play ball here. So bear with me here, guys. We'll get this done and fixed here in a heartbeat. Let's see here. Question. Nope. Spoon like blood. Who remembers that FPS? I don't think I remember that. Uh, yeah, more like Diablo. Very good, good, good uh, comparison. That whole poor beholder has lost a. Yes, the beholder has lost a goldfish. It is a sad day. Uh, it is a very sad day when the beholder has lost a goldfish. So. Okay, so we have it. We're going to transition here real quick here. Okay, so you guys should be able to see this now. We'll hit play. You guys can watch we this trailer. Them just so you can see it. it's, it's actually there. Wraiths. Giants. They call us snacks. So when those bastards come to claim your world, send their ass to hell. And there you have it, guys. All right, now. So, as you can see, it's pretty cool. They've got a lot of cool stuff going on with it. Uh, pretty excited to see this one come out. I know that I will probably be deciding what I'm going to be doing with this one here at some point. It's it's definitely going to be exciting to to try to play this with some of my friends here. 
um, both on the cast and crew, as well as some of you guys on Discord when we get a chance. So um, hopefully some of you guys won't try to murder me quickly like you all do when we play Among Us. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. You guys will probably all murder me like we do in Among Us. I, I just know it. So. All right. So, uh, let me see here. What do we got next on the fun fun zone here? Duramora looking innocent. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, let's see here. Um, next up, we've got Vault of Magic. Vault of Magic is the latest cool G-Wiz thing from Kobold Press. Uh, been very excited to see that. Uh, Kobold Press is also celebrating their 15th uh, year anniversary. That is also one of the coolest things ever. The small but fierce RPG publisher of Midgard World uh, World Book and the Tome of Beasts is celebrating its 15 year anniversary. They've got some cool stuff on their uh, on their website. You should go check it out when you can. The uh, the Grimoire of the other thing is their their Vault of Magic is a grimoire of new magic items for 5th edition campaigns. It brings wild surprises to your gaming table from unknown potions to fabled weapons and armor to everyday magic that would become a campaign staple. Over 800 items to start, many by leading tabletop designers, most of which you probably have heard of if you're very familiar with that. Uh, <laughs> alt Jero, if you're interested in Among Us, it's definitely on in the Games Tavern, typically on Saturdays. Check it out. Uh, but back to back to <laughs> Vault of Magic, because you guys get me off track because you're amazing. Um, there's something in here for your game, whether it's a new game underway or a long-term campaign that needs a jolt of new inspiration for both the heroes and, more importantly for you DMs out there, for the villains. So check it out with 800 items. I, I don't know that I wouldn't be hard-pressed to enjoy such a thing. The thing I like about Kobold Press is they have a lot of experience in design. They put together a, an amazing professionally developed product. And the other thing I like about it is it's balanced. As a dungeon master, I see a lot of supplements out there that people are throwing together that, that kind of don't really understand balance. Someone's trying to get their, their cool Uber thing out there and make it official by putting it on DM skill or the, the, the simulation of officialness. Not that there's anything that makes something more or less official when, when somebody else makes it. What does make something important, though, is its usability and its flexibility in a game. If it's all over the place, if it's unbalanced, it tends to make a game unfun for anyone using it. Uh, either for the one person using it or for everybody else at the table who has to endure it. Well, the guys at Kobold Press, they do a really good job making sure it fits. That an uncommon item in their book will match an uncommon item in other 5e systems. So, fantastic. And you've, oh, Wizard of DC, you've seen Tome of Beasts. Well, that's awesome to hear. Watch us this May for some cool stuff from them. That's all I can say. Just watch this May. All right. Um, does anyone else uh, have any questions about uh, Cobalt Press and the Vault of Magic? Definitely check it out when you get a chance. I, I know you will not be disappointed. Okay. How's the music? The music too loud? You guys got it? You're good? Next up, Mutants and Masterminds. I'm kind of excited about this. If you've played Mutants and Masterminds, this one is great because this one is called Into the Idiot Box. It's an adventure uh, from Green Ronin Publishing. It's really good. Uh, what begins as a normal... I love how they did a write-up on this. What begins as a normal day fighting crime becomes an impossible journey into a dimension of nostalgia-fueled television when a comic trickster demands the heroes relieve his boredom. It pushes through all sorts of TV tropes, action shows, all sorts of other things, and it's a consistent and never-ending batch of fun, if you really want it to be. Um, this is by Jason Keeley. I believe this is uh, hit one of his first major forays into this, and it's, it looks like a really good product. It's a 20-page full-color book in the PDF format. It's a one-shot adventure for four to six PL10 heroes. And much of the adventurous challenge comes from creative role-playing, making it appropriate for smaller or lower PL hero teams by increasing or decreasing the number or power level of the fictional opponents in the hero's encounter. 
So power level 10, you're good to go. A little lower, drop a little bit on the on the opponents. It's good for a lot of things. So a flexibility level that you, you can't beat. It hits that magic sweet spot of four to six players. It's a great game waiting to happen. So excellent, excellent. The idea was to have total chill music that just does sound hilarious. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Um, that's really it on the TTRPG front. It was pretty light today. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on everything, so be sure and give me some feedback. Next up, Reaper Miniatures. What is going on? What in the world happened to our image here? Hold on one second. We're going to fix this live. What happened? Our image is tor terrible now. Well, you know what? I'm going to fix that just by dropping that link beautifully into the chat for you guys so you can see it yourselves. Boom. Check out the March releases yourselves. I don't know what happened there. That's uh, that's really sad. All right. But these are some of the cool things that they're coming out with for March. Small World Galadon and Small World Lisette. You may be familiar with some of these. Essentially, these are almost like, uh, almost like chibis. Uh, but in miniature form, big heads, tiny bodies, oversized weapons in some cases. They're really interesting in that they, um, I believe they're from the Pathfinder world. Check them out. The Profane Altar in books and the Sealed Sarcophagus, fantastic scenery pieces waiting to be used. I can't wait to see those on any game table I'm on. Uh, and then also, uh, Gargoyle and Brazier Pillar Tops, and not Pillow Tops, pillar tops. So if you put these on top of your pillars, if you buy the pillar set, you can put these on top and they'll add an additional look to it. Uh, you can also probably put these in buildings, other scenery as you see fit. They also have a female minotaur that's come out that looks pretty killer. And the newest sculpt that I'm really impressed with is Lost Souls. Lost Souls is great because it comes with a series of miniatures, some of which are connected, some of which are not, that allows you to put um, what looks like a whole bunch of undead ghosts, spirits, that can be used for a variety of uses in your TTRPG games or dioramas if you wish to make them that way. Um, they do come all unpainted. Uh, I don't know that I would paint the Lost Souls, but they're, you know, someone's going to have something cool. Every time I think I understand something, you know, just leaving it alone, someone comes up with something creative and I get excited to see what they do. Uh, so some really cool stuff from Reaper. Anyone picking up any scenery for themselves? I'd love to see that. More ghosts. Villas, you could always use more ghosts in your games. I tell you what, um, I, I don't think I'd ever see a problem with more ghosts. I, I think most of your players might, though. And if any of your players are in chat, um, you know, pay attention. Um... For those of you who are big scenery people, uh, we just did a recent thing on uh, one of our paint shows on scenery, but uh, we should probably do some more of that. I think I think scenery is a, a great thing, and scenery is so easy to paint. Let's see here, what else we got? Um, okay, next up, the Int. Yes, you guys definitely saw the Int. The Int. This is the Mighty Int Tree Beard. Not just any Int, THE Int. The Int of Ints. Um, the oldest and mightiest. This also includes the plucky hobbits Merry and Pippin. Uh, Treebeard is considered a natural leader in any Fangorn army list if you're playing Lord of the Rings or if you're just using this as a large signature piece on your hobby table. Both in terms of the narrative of Middle-earth, this near unstoppable uh, int is a power on the battlefield. And also you get various options to both have Merry and Pippin on his shoulders, just like he did in, in Last March of the Ents, or without them on his shoulders, uh, as well as two separate miniatures for Merry and Pippin on foot in their own. This entire model is plastic, and that's the most interesting part about it, is, is the, the development of plastic has, has pushed so far that things like organic lines are now possible. Um, Check out the, you can see the leaf work, you can see the mossiness. Uh, this is a very natural, organically lined tree beard. It's not, it's not pushing the limit. Uh, the most valuable int, MVE, good, good call, James. 
Good call. Um, I see nothing but awesomeness here. If uh, if you if you don't get this, if you're a miniature painter and you don't get this, I'd be surprised. It's full of more details than I've ever seen on an int so far, and it does look like Treebeard from the the movies. So a very skilled piece. Um, of any of you guys Lord of the Rings fans? I would love to hear if you guys are in chat. Raise your hands if you are. Give me some emojis. Okay. Next up, transitioning to something a little different. Um, we know that... Uh, where did it go? Oh, no. Uh, Strixhaven School of Mages uh, releases on March 25th. That's all we... Well, it doesn't release. That's not true. It, uh, the previews start March 25th. So... There's nothing else on there about this other than it's the College of Mages. So, you know, magic comes to college. Should be interesting. Any of you guys magic players? Oh my gosh, you guys found an, found another emoji uh, of me screaming in chat. That's awesome. Um, if any of you play Magic, I would love to get your feedback on Strixhaven and your thoughts on it before the release. I know some of you guys have already been checking it out. Um, and I know that some of you guys in the Magic chat have already been talking about some of the combos. Uh, and you're, you're concerned about what Strixhaven is going to do. So, love it. Love it. Love the new Ili hidden Iliana card. A Liliana card. Okay. White Magic card set. Never learned to play it, though. alt Jero, you're, you're in the right place, my friend. So... Sort of like a school version of Guild Pack. I I don't think I've played Guild Pack, so I wouldn't know. But if you can give us some feedback on that, I'd love to know what that means. You've got me speechless. What you got? All right. Well, we'll just we'll just move on. Now, this next one comes for those of you with deep pockets or just a love of technology. The new Pixels electronic dice. These are smart dice. Um, and not only that, they're amazing in that they, oh, the guild pack where they combine several colors. Yeah, I saw that, that was great. So this dice piece that is amazing is smart dice, they light up, completely customizable. You can change the colors they light up with, all sorts of other stuff. They come with rechargeable bases that you plug them into. They uh, they come in large ones, small ones. You see the independent ones there on the screen. They come in onyx black, hematite gray, midnight galaxy, aurora sky, and clear. Um, they are a bit pricey at $200 for a single set. Uh, but to be fair, no other dice in the world do what these dice do. Um, they not only roll, but they send to your screen what, what was rolled and also can total everything up for you as well. It's pretty amazing. Um, they know what the numbers are that were rolled. Not only that, but I had initial concerns when these came up that these things were not balanced. And what I found out is not only are they balanced, they're balanced better than the, the other dice that are mold injected. I guess machining the dice the way they do and making sure the electronics were in there, they not only are balanced, they also, and this is the interesting bit, not only are they balanced, but they also had a third party do the balance test on them. And they found that they were in many cases more balanced than say Chessex dice that were injection molded or machined. So, uh, good question in chat. Do they roll themselves or do you still have to roll, throw them? You still have to roll them. Uh, if you check that video, you can see plenty of video of people rolling them. Um, you see the dice tray on the screen there. That sh that's a, a screen capture from them rolling dice that we captured to show you what it looks like after they hit the, the thing. Um, in addition to this, they're keeping this... They, they have official planned integrations with Roll20, Foundry, and they're already working with them to make them compatible. They're in talks with a couple other groups. I, I won't name them because until they're actually like saying that they, they have integrations planned, it's still, you know, it's still, you know, talking to each other and figuring out what's going to happen. 
What I really also like about this particular one is Pixel's API is completely open source and available on GitHub. They've committed to open source development, which I absolutely love. Uh, open source means it's less likely to be hacked uh, nefariously. It means there's a lot of other people watching it. It also means there's a lot of other people that could make even more cool things with this and also make it work with more apps. The dice are amazing. They feel heavier. They're, they're not as heavy as, say, metal dice, but they're heavier than the, than the resin dice that you may be familiar with rolling. Um, light up is already cool even without the auto total features. Yeah, exactly. Um, Dura likes to send to your favorite app. Um, this is fully funded at 2.7 million already and has 15 days to go. So you've got 15 more days to get your sets on order if you're going to do this. Check it out when you get a chance. Uh, this would be a lot of fun to, to, to use, I'm sure. So for the right person, this is an amazing opportunity to get some really cool dice. Um, it's won a whole host of awards from Hackaday, Maker, uh, and, 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 and a variety of other different uh, uh, groups there. Mythbusters will show sure re-roll thousands of them into a pool or something. <laughs> yeah, and Wizard of DC, if you're familiar with open API sets and, and working with those, you're going to love this. I have a feeling it's it, the, the, we're only just now seeing the starts of rollable dice. Again, my biggest concern with, with any type of electronics in dice is are they balanced and are they going to just still give me that entropy that I'm looking for with dice. I don't have any belief I'm going to control the dice's outcome, but I certainly believe that the entropy is more live than I'll ever see with, a, say, a computerized dice set. But, you know, it is what it is. Next up, Kraken, Kraken Ships Miniatures. They are producing hard-to-get miniature combinations. 28 millimeter figures, um, different races and archetypes. Each set will include four miniatures. Uh, the stretch goals include Minotaurs and Goblin characterful miniatures. This is their second Kickstarter. They had a successful first go, and they continue to be focused on some of those harder to get miniatures in various race and class combos that no one else seems to be making. A great way to play against your type and have a miniature to back it up. So if you want to play a uh, cleric or a bard el el elephant character, this is your way to do it. A random number generator in a number generator. Hear me out. <laughs> I love it. I love what you guys say in chat. Um, these miniatures are highly detailed. Some of you see those dark spots on the miniatures, and that's because those are the areas that come in a clear colored plastic that will match well, a translucent uh, resin that will match the style and look of the elemental planes that they represent. So earth will have some crystals, air will have blowing air or lightning bolts, fire will have fire, and water will have gushing water streams, which you can see on, on some of the Tessera sets there. And the Voldeck set is really cool in that it, it comes with winged bird people. It's a great different take on some of the other races you may see that are winged bird people. So awesome to see that as well. Um, to go a little further, uh, this Kickstarter only just got started. It has 22 days to go. It still has not hit funding yet. We're putting it out there because we think it's a great way to get some of those harder to get miniatures. And if this is something you guys would be interested in, we'd love to see you support it. All right, next up on the Kickstarter, a favorite tabletop uh group that we like to work with Monty Cook Games some of our some of our folks are very familiar with Monty Cook Games they are fantastic in that they created this this the darkest house the darkest house is a descent into horror for 5e or any RPG that will make your campaign or characters better it's a uh, optimized for an online experience which i thought was an interesting take and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Monty Cook realizes that a lot of us are playing remotely now. And they said, why not design a gaming experience that actually capitalizes on that? That gets us all those things that we'd want to see, right? So we're taking a trope that you know, right? The, the weird house that you've seen before. If, if not in your town, then, then in some other. You hear the rumors about people going in and exploring and some come out changed. Others never come back at all. 
when they go back to look for him, no one is there. Well, you've heard all these rumors and well, someday those rumors may find you. So the darkest house is a digital product designed specifically to the needs of running and playing games online. So they took advantage of that opportunity and they built this to take maximum advantage of this mode of play. So think of it like an RPG book. Imagine to take the most of your online environment and then do more with it. So every image and map is conveniently shareable and downloadable. Each encounter is formatted to your screen, giving you everything you need in a single view. Text for sharing with the players is easily copied with a single click. A rich network of hyperlinks throughout this do the documentation makes navigation simple and intuitive. And the darkest house is as easy on the GM as the house itself is challenging to the PCs, which means it's really easy on the GM and it's really challenging to the PCs. PCs beware. Um, also, it plays on most of the game systems that you're already playing on right now. If you're 5e or if you're in the Cypher system, it already fits. It works beautifully within it already. And then finally, the Darkest House works in conjunction with your preferred online TTRPG platforms. Uh, for example, Zoom, Discord, or virtual tabletops like Roll20, Astral, potentially others. And only the GM needs a copy of Darkest House, like a conventional RPG product that gives the Game Master the information, resources, and tools to run the game and handouts, images, and other shareable items to distribute as appropriate to the players. The great part about this is this Kickstarter is already fully funded and about to surpass their highest stretch goal so far with 10 more days to go to get your pledge in. And if you pledge at above certain levels, you get special additional content only for the Kickstarter. It's supposed to be really, really cool. So definitely check it out when you get a chance. Um, how many of you guys think you're going to be playing this one? How many? I, I know I'm going to be playing this. I'm going to be getting this. This sounds like a great intro or side side thing into uh, like Curse of Strahd or uh, uh, other scary things from World of Darkness potentially. You just finished Strahd, so maybe towards October? Perfect, James. Perfect. We'll get that right in there for you. And they've got artwork that is unbelievable and really evokes the spooky feeling that this is. Um, all right, so moving on. ReaperCon. ReaperCon 2021. This is what we know. ReaperCon 2021 is scheduled for September 2nd through the 5th. Uh, I believe that's a uh, Labor Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend. I forget which is which. Um, the safety rules are in discussion, but have not been announced at this time, at least where I've been able to see them. Uh, I am I know the folks at Reaper are very cognizant of safety in the current situation, so they'll do whatever it takes to make sure it's either safe or they'll, they'll make decisions as they need to. This is all we really have on it, but what we do know is that you absolutely want to book your rooms early if you're going to this convention. I know the first block of rooms that they had have already been booked, another block of rooms is coming, and then more is coming at other hotels as well. Um, having gone to ReaperCon's Virtual Con, I can tell you that this is a fantastic convention experience. Reaper puts on a great convention. This is an opportunity to check them out, get a chance when you go. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'd also like to make a big thanks to our sponsor in closing out today, Overhead Games. They've sponsored today's show. They're helping us give away a wonderful, wonderful uh uh, uh, avatar character generator we love that we use it actually on some stuff right now and this is your chance to get one for yourself uh, it comes with a pack plus three fantasy expansion packs on the giveaway tonight so be sure and enter the giveaway typing exclamation epic uh, make sure you get those entries in we love having you on here um, all right and with that that's the news and new releases folks you guys excited let me know what you guys got going on here. Yar! Okay, I got a good yar from James. And interview time. All right, so everybody should be relatively excited for the interview that's coming up. Uh, what we're going to do is we are going to go into a quick uh, break. Hold on one second. I need to make sure that uh, everything's set up for that. And then while we're on break... 
we are going to uh, make sure that um, yep we're going to make sure that the interview gets set up correctly and everything is ready to rock and roll so um, <laughs> I already said I played Dark Alliance with me oh man you guys are all gonna play Dark Alliance with me that's awesome you guys are all gonna throttle me I know it so alright guys so with that that's the news we're going into break. See you guys in a real quick moment. Cheers. Hi, it's Reed from Whiskey Magic and Destruction, here to tell you about That Minnie's Paint Show every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific. On That Minnie's Paint Show, we're going to paint miniatures every Sunday showing you how quick and easy it is to paint miniatures to a high standard for your tabletop. And these are the same miniatures we will be using on stream. In addition to that, we'll have guests and audience questions and participation is awesome and expected. So be sure to tune in, ask your pet questions about painting and have a great time with us. We'll see you on That Minis Paint Show only on the Games Tavern Network. I'll read you loud and clear. Hello, can hey. you hear me? Hey, Darren, it's a pleasure to meet you for the first time. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. Is Hal going to be on shortly? He should be. Okay. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to have his uh, audio turned on on his Discord, so sometimes he doesn't uh, pop up as quickly as it might otherwise be. Okay. Well, we got some. Oops. Hi, it's Reed from Whiskey Magic and Destruction, here to tell you about that mini's paint show every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific. On That Minis Paint Show, we're going to paint miniatures every Sunday, showing you how quick and easy it is to paint miniatures to a high standard for your tabletop. These are the same miniatures we will be using on the screen. In addition to that, we'll have guests and audience questions and participation is awesome and expected. So be sure to tune in, ask your pet questions about painting, and have a great time with us. We'll see you on That Minis Paint Show only Slow news week.
Resort to stronger measures. logged on to Discord, but uh, not responding. Oh. He just stepped away, although he didn't answer his phone either. It's also possible that he's having trouble with his camera and his end getting it started. He's kind of probably in between uh, you and me, which is I have a very simple setup. He's got a very complicated setup, but he doesn't use it every day. So sometimes he gets it into weird modes. Nice change of pace after we were busy uh, opening our marketplace yesterday. <laughs> That's apparently a new title. I've worked there before. Yes. <laughs> ah, there's Al. I did. Audio coming through okay for you there? Well, the microphone sounds great. I don't know if we do or not. <laughs> yeah, you can't tell it, but Hal's looking at a desk full of uh, equipment that looks like he lives in some movie studio. <laughs> exactly. Well, no. if, he was cyberpunk, if he was into cyberpunk, he would actually have a second screen rather than just using his laptop. <laughs> That's true. 
and have like five screens stacked up over here. You wouldn't even be able to see me from the other side of the room because of all the screens. You get distracted easily enough as is when I'm trying to talk to you. Yeah, exactly. But usually I've got three other people trying to chat with me about stuff that actually need me to do work. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. The only problem is when I'm trying to get you to do work. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Usually why I have three other people. And we're live. Hey, guys, we are back. Um, one second here. Oh, there we go. There we go. So we're <laughs> back. I am being joined by the awesome Hal and Darren from Shard Tabletop. If you guys have questions, this is your opportunity and your chance to, to get those in. Uh, a lot of really cool folks uh, would kill to have this opportunity. And I, I, I have buried a couple bodies in the back and sacrificed a chicken just to talk to you guys today. So I really appreciate it. Um, Darren, this is the first time I've actually gotten to meet you face to face. And thank you so much for your time. And Hal, obviously, you know, we talked a little bit in the coordination meeting. And thank you yep. so much. You guys are both big nerds. Yes. Uh, yeah, that, that's an underestimate. <laughs> we were probably that before the term was invented. <laughs> yeah, right. So let's kind of start at the beginning. Did, how long have you two known each other? uh let's say first day of high school 1982 so really yeah really that's a that's that's an amazing story already just to because <laughs> you know there's stories behind that right yeah so we ended up with a couple classes together i guess that sophomore year of high school and then you know started hanging out playing dd D, D together and you know kind of over the course of high school basically you know we're, uh, we're became both... inseparable and still aren't separable <laughs> Were, were both of you gamers before then as well? Uh, I think we both started playing, what, around 1980, Darren, something like that? We'd both been playing a couple of years by that point? Yeah, that's probably about right. Yeah, we both ended up being the dungeon masters of our high, of our middle school groups, right? You know, like okay. I, I, you know, I think I might have actually started even earlier, like in sixth grade or something. I don't remember. Well, 78, mm -hmm. 79, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So that's one of those original... Uh, starter packs for uh, yeah, Dungeons yeah. and Dragons yeah, and one of the old box sets and the then you know, upgrade yeah was it the upgrade to the first player's handbook yeah. and you know all that sort of thing you know so you know I was a I was an old school D&D &D guy too kind of like you guys and you couldn't you know there was kind of like ways you could tell if someone was a a D&D &D player or not sometimes just by you know how they dressed or how they walked around what were the ways you guys were able to tell or was it Hey, here's my DMG. Have you seen this book before? Is that, <laughs> how did you guys find each other on day one of high school and realize you were both like yeah, D&D nerds? You know, we we're both those dudes that hung out in the back of the class and, you know, made fun of everybody else when they couldn't keep up and, mm -hmm. you know, all, 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 all that sort of stuff. And so I don't know that on day one we knew each other were, were, were playing D&D, &D, but certainly by the end of the second week we did. <laughs> okay. Uh, it wasn't that long. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. um from from high school, were you always D and D players? Uh, it's you know it's definitely gone on and off over the years. I, I like I, I played 
you know, during college, I played the, the first version of Harn Master or whatever for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I think I've played pretty much every edition of D&D &D except for uh, th third, um, mostly because uh, when third edition was out, I had really small kids and like wasn't playing anything much that, yeah. and, you know, traveling a bunch for work. Um, but by the time fourth edition came out, uh, you know, my kids were old enough to play. And, uh, and so we, you know, we're teaching them and, uh, and doing that sort of thing. And then when fifth came out, we really jumped, but I guess we both jumped in right about then, like 20, 2015, something like that. Shortly after fifth edition came out and started playing a lot again, mm -hmm. um, because our kids were old enough that we could actually get out of the house and play something together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Darren, was that the same for you or? Yeah, I got a little bit after Hal started back into it and. He was, I was looking through his books, I think, at your place. when. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because my wife and I were playing at a local game store, right, you know, and doing doing some stuff and and playing, you know, the kids were, were playing and all that kind of stuff. And then Darren was over and, like, you know, we started, he started thumbing through some of the books and we said, hey, if you want to want to join join the group go ahead and like you know we we uh, we had a good time and then we another guy dm for a while and then yeah and then you know we when i really got back into dming full time that's when the whole shard journey started so yeah <laughs> well it started a little before that because as soon as we started back i didn't want to have a paper character sheet right yeah okay okay and so you must have experimented with every available tool for an iphone an ipad you know whatever else to to, to do digital character sheets and uh you yeah, know. i probably went through like six or eight different things and some quickly and some i played for a little while yeah, yeah exactly we'll circle back to shard here for sure um that's the main event for you guys and and for us too but i'd really like to get to know you guys before shard sure. because all those things is what went into creating it in many respects as well your experiences your your journey yeah so from high school you guys went to did you guys go to the same college together as well or no nope, we uh, we went separate ways during college but stayed in touch the whole time like we worked at the same place over the summer between freshman and sophomore year and then delivering pizzas believe it or not uh back and, when uh, you could actually do that and pay for school yeah we yeah. could actually do that right exactly yeah um and then you know hanging out and uh, and that sort of stuff and then uh darren was at north carolina state i was at uh in in western kentucky at kentucky wesleyan we we're both studying computer science so we were you know in touch a lot and then mm -hmm. occasionally he would intern in lexington where we grew up and, and uh we you know get together and hang out and you know so it was all summers and all that and then as soon as we both graduated uh we uh we started uh doing summer vacations together for a few years because he, he moved out right after high, uh, college here to the pacific northwest where we both live now and we started going on vacation our wives and and us would go on vacations together right and uh and spend you know a week or more during the summer hanging out and that sort of stuff so was that hanging and then out? In '94, meeting? he convinced me to come to Microsoft, where he had been since 1990, and uh, yeah. and the rest is history. We've been in the same town ever since. So, like uh, Bellevue, the town that Microsoft built. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. live in Sammamish, and he lives in North Bend, so we're both you know okay. not that yeah. far from Redmond, where the the, the the Microsoft World headquarters is. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I used to have to go out there uh, at least one week every month. Uh, when I did some work for a different company out there. Um, yeah, I think the top, in 94, when I moved here, the tallest building in Bellevue was like, you know, the Hyatt Hotel or something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at 18 stories. And it was the only one over about five stories, mm -hmm. I think. And now I think there are, God, There's how innumerable many skyscrapers. That, I mean, it's like, it's yeah. a glass city, basically. It's yeah. like, you know, it's incredible the amount of buildings that have been built there over the years. Some of the best sushi I've ever had was in that town. <laughs> we've got quite basically asian food of every variety not just mm -hmm. sushi and japanese but like thai food you know chinese everything is incredible here good so. pho as well yeah 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 vietnamese there's a pho place like literally a mile and a half miles here so yeah yeah so you guys both started on the east coast and then you both moved to the pacific northwest we both grew up in lexington kentucky yeah oh so, wow lexington yeah. kentucky so um, the Seattle freeze and, and all that other stuff, notwithstanding, how was that adjustment for you guys? I mean, 
because not long after that, Wizards was was big, and Wizards acquired TSR. Was that like yep. big for you guys as well? I mean, to have it in your backyard. Yeah, I don't think it had a huge influence at being here in the backyard, like at the time. But obviously, over the years, yeah, we got to know some of the people that were involved, and and uh, you know, either directly or peripherally. And like, what's really been interesting is you know, being here where it is now with doing what we're doing is so many of the other companies are here too. So like mm -hmm. Cobalt Press is here, you know, Wolfgang lives right in, Kir in Kirkland and, mm -hmm. you know, the Pathfinder guys are down in Redmond and mm -hmm. there's, you know, you, you name it, like there's so many Private other. Privateer Press as well and a couple of yeah, other companies. Yeah, in Woodville, yeah. right? And yeah, absolutely. There's just a ton, a ton of them that are, you know, within, you know, 30 miles of our house or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in the greater, you know, sort of Seattle metropolitan area, there's just, tons and tons of, of gaming companies. Yeah. Although it was, you remember when we were first started at Microsoft, uh, we were playing a lot of Magic the Gathering. Yeah, yeah, which was, yeah, and, and Wizards actually had local, like they had their own version of local stores over mm -hmm. in, the, in the university district and, you know, that sort of stuff. I actually held a, a ship party for one of my groups at one of their, one, you know, like it had these big clubs that were like arcades basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so magic, the gathering and, and you name it, all kinds of stuff going on at that thing. Yeah. I started uh, playing magic in 1995. I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I, I was playing even before that. Cause yeah. I was playing in Kentucky when I, before I moved out here. Yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, that was our, uh, that I've got was our boxes, game. boxes of the cards from like, you know, the, you know, uh, what the original Dark Ages set and all of the, the sets in the early 90s. So, tons of them. Yeah. One day I'll dig those out and, you know, finance my retirement on what people will pay for magic cards these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's been a huge surge. I actually did a, a news, news thing, uh, kind of an editorial op-ed on people were buying up all these Pokemon and... and uh, and uh, magic cards and they were they were literally raising the prices of all the cards across the board magic's yeah. a lot more fluid i don't think it raised it as much but in pokemon's case it, it absolutely did yeah but people were like well should we should we shift our pensions over to that and i'm like no no please <laughs> for the love of all that's holy don't do that you know um <laughs> You know, yeah, well, we've got a we've got a few collectible hobbies because we're also both into wine. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, we we got you know, I get a huge cellar full of wine. So does Darren, you know, that's yeah. their stuff. And so, you know, it, it, people make try to make that an investment too. They're like, oh, let me buy you know Bordeaux futures or whatever. It's like, really, no. It's like, yeah, I only buy what I'm going to drink. <laughs> well, certain, certain commodities can can have some opportunities, but trying to invest into uh, Beanie Baby futures is not on the list of things. For yeah, me to exactly. Do, you know? or, Sports cards, yeah, or yeah. you name it. <laughs> and the other thing that we tried to explain is, is you know, whereas people are saying it's worth that price, try finding a buyer who's willing to pay for it. Right. You know, so that's right. It's more like uh, gambling than it is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. It absolutely yeah. is. That, that card was worth that to Wayne Gretzky because the million dollars doesn't mean anything to him, but like any other buyer isn't going to pay that for it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, as you guys shifted and you you grew up and you were in technology, you were always into. Now you're both programmers, code writers. Or we both started that way, though. Mm -hmm. Darren stayed a lot closer to it than I did over the course of his career. So yeah, okay. we both we both started as coders. In fact, you know, my first job out of college, I was I was doing process control and industrial equipment, and so like low level, very low level code that, you know, the, you know, machine code. Machine that had, code. Yeah. 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 They had like, you know, budgets in microseconds for how long it, you know, the execution cycle could be because of the piece of equipment it was controlling and, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So. Output and, and all that other stuff, it, it cost dollars, you know, so. Yeah. And Darren, Darren was, you know, did a bunch of internships and then started at Microsoft in 1990 straight out of college. So he's been, done a bunch of great projects at Microsoft. So, as you guys uh, continued to develop, were you, pl you, you had that, you already mentioned that there was some time periods where you had to step away from the tabletop gaming on a consistent basis. Um, what other games besides Magic were you playing that may have influenced, you know, where you are today? Uh, yeah, I mean, you name it. I mean, like every, every board game imaginable, Risk, Monopoly, you know, as kids, you know, uh, 
I, I, yeah, I just if we turn my camera around here, you'll see a, a, the, under the pool table over here a stack of board games that are like include Catan and Small World and you know King of Tokyo and <laughs> you, you name it, like all kinds of crazy stuff. That's right, and we've played them all. I guess the one we play most consistently now is what Dominion, Darren. Probably is the most consistent. Probably Dominion's a great board game. A great, yeah. great board game. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, just the infinite variety of cards available for that thing. It's in some ways similar to Magic in that it's a deck building game, but it's a deck building game in a very different way. Right? It's mm -hmm. everybody's pulling from the same pool of cards, and and uh, and you have to basically figure out the strategy line through the board fairly quickly. It's not like how many years can I spend building the perfect deck, mm -hmm. right? By collecting them, it's uh, literally at the beginning of every game you got to assess the board and say, okay, what's the fastest line through this board that's going to get me to a victory? Uh, condition yeah. yeah you know, so it's a it's a it's a strategist game for sure and then i feel the same way about right. settlers of Catan. it's a game you start with family and friends and end with everyone that you hate yeah, yeah. exactly or everyone yeah. that hates you if you're yeah. good at it yeah <laughs> vice versa yeah yeah exactly yeah i think I'm, I'm looking over i think i've got the star trek edition of Catan, you know sitting over there so oh, yeah could, oh yeah. yeah set phasers to torture yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> And then, you know, a few of the, the you know, D&D &D derivative game boards, Castle Ravenloft and, you know, that, that you know, that sort of stuff. So uh, Munchkin, the card game, right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They played that a lot with the kids when, when they were little. I'm a big fan of Munchkin. I, I love it. I, yep. I've had nothing but entertainment with the innuendos and the silliness of the game. Yeah, um, yeah we've got the... Cthulhu edition and you know a few of the other expansions for it and sometimes we'll just mix them all up and play some you know a massive draw with all these crazy combinations and it's uh, yeah um i believe steve jackson has actually helped uh, another charity i worked with um called uh, operation supply drop and they donated a whole bunch of games to the troops to deliver over so mm -hmm. the troops would have some games because it's actually you know, everybody wants video games and stuff they say, and then you get over overseas and you realize, well, I can't exactly plug it into a hill in the desert. Uh, yeah, so, uh, exactly. Especially and if you need internet access. Getting good internet access is a challenge as well over there. So, And, and sometimes a game that makes noise is not exactly good in enemy territory. <laughs> a card game you if, can play quietly if, is fine. If you're playing cards, then you're already making too much noise if you're worried about stealth at that point. but Because, uh, yeah. you know, people are, especially if you're playing... Uh, munchkin because you know you're trying to kill everybody else and again <laughs> it's a game you start with people who you know your friends and family and by the end of it everybody hates each other it's a it's a wonderful game yeah yeah seems like that might be a theme for the kind of games you like john no 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 not at all not at all actually it, go ahead darren you were going to say something i'm saying we, we've also played a bunch of video games over the years too oh yeah talk talk me through some of the video games you guys have played because i know that that influences you guys as well I think that like the console one that we started with was what PlayStation Two, mm -hmm. lots of uh, Crash Bandicoot and aren't those fun games? Yeah, 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 that sort of stuff. And then, God, even before that, like you know, going back to what was the what was the one we spent hours in the arcade with in high school, like the uh, Gyrus. Right. You know, that sort of stuff. We could both beat it from start to finish. Right. You know, that sort of stuff. We'd literally stand there for hours playing on one quarter sort of thing. Right. You know, Joust. Um, Do you remember Joust? Uh, yep. Yeah, played that one. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Uh, Robotron that you could do cooperative. I think that was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Spent yeah. Uh, many a quarter in an arcade. My dad actually fixed arcade systems uh, on the side. So he worked with an arcade company and fix their systems occasionally. And so I remember one night he loaded up a pickup truck with six like full-size arcade systems and brought them over to the house. Yeah. And he had a party with all these people and he says, "Hey, look, we can come play video games." And like I remember the living room had like Asteroids and <laughs> Galaga and all these different like well, amazing games and I just sat there as like a 4-year-old like mashing buttons like my life depended on it. So the first building the first building Darren and I worked with, it worked in at Microsoft was, uh, it's connected to two other buildings by sky bridges, right? So mm -hmm. it's building 16 on the campus. It connects to both 17 and 18 by sky bridge, mm -hmm. right? And that kind of stuff. And essentially by, you know, the mid to late nineties, you know, arcade games, the, at least the classic ones were already in decline. Right. And so mm -hmm. basically, you know, a bunch of people had bought them up 
right? And, and fill those tubes between the buildings with these things. And so, you, you know, in the, sometime in the middle of your 12 or 16 hour day, you just go out there and play a video game for a half hour or whatever else and come back, right? <laughs> it's like, yep. you know, uh, it just, and, you know, that and mini golf in the hallways were probably the two most <laughs> advanced forms of recreation at Microsoft at that time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the oh, the life of living, living and working at a tech company. And I do mean living in some cases. Oh, we, we definitely lived there the first first two years. Yeah. The first two years I was at here, I think we were both working 100 hours a week. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What, what was the joke at the time? You know, we only work half days, any 12 hours you want. Yeah, that's exactly right. Any 12 hours you want. Oh uh, as gosh. long as it, as long as you do it seven days, uh, and, and only seven days a week, you're fine. <laughs> oh my goodness, breakneck pace! You had to love the work, I hope, or at least we did. Love and like what the, you got paid it was for. Growing so much at the time, it was just a lot of fun to see the impact the products were having in market and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just you know, uh, I mean, the year I joined '94, Microsoft was had just reported like five billion in revenue or something. Mm -hmm. And the next year, the goal was eight. So you can imagine being a $5 billion company that's going to grow 60%. Like it, nobody had ever it's, done it's it. It's insane growth for most companies that, yeah, that are literally already Literally nobody had ever done it before, right? And so, yeah. and, and, and actually a few years later, you know, after the DOJ suit settled up and so forth in the early 2000s, like in 2003, the SEC level to a fine at Microsoft for the, was the first time ever somebody had been uh, been fined for underreporting revenue because in the period of 95 96 97 or whatever else they underreported revenue because they were reserving too much in the SEC's opinion against future liabilities for maintenance of the software mm -hmm. um, that was of course during the Windows 95 office 95 period when revenue was just you know skyrocket ridiculous yeah right yeah. so the year they made 8 billion the i think the sec said they underreported by a billion dollars so they actually went from 5 to 9 in one year <laughs> oh my goodness that. that's amazing <laughs> yeah that's intense yeah shifting forward to modern 5e play when you guys got started with with 5e you said it was like 2015 if i recall from my yeah, here. for me it was i think Darren was about a year later something like that oh yeah. Darren what, so what why did it take you a year longer Darren He's got kids that are younger than mine. Yep. <laughs> so how many kids do you guys have? Uh, three. three. Yeah, he has three. I have two. two. And his youngest one is like, you know, the the, 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 the thing that lagged him by a year. <laughs> okay. Our older ones are basically the same ages. Okay. Okay. In fact, our young, the younger, his middle one and my younger one are a month apart, basically. Uh, and, uh, That's awesome. I have, I have five. They're all amazing. Um, cool. And uh, I, I think, time to do anything, huh? We have five combined, and I can't imagine. <laughs> well, they they do spend some time at their mothers in Kansas. So it, I, but when they're with me, it's it's all about them. It's really hard to do anything else and not want to spend time with them when you don't see them all the time. But yeah, absolutely. But uh, even when they're here, I mean, half the time, what we try to do is go have fun and play games because I don't sure. I don't get to see them as often as I'd like. So yeah, um, that's why I do those things with them. Um, and then, because I mean, who wants to see, Hey, let's go to work with dad. I did that a few times with them. They didn't enjoy that at all. So, uh, you know, let's go re rehab a house. That's so much not fun for them. So, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. Well, they were a little more excited to come and play the video games when I was at Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so in 2015, 2016, really at, just as things were switching to 5e and really getting ramped up, you guys got started in 5e. How was that as, as if it was similar to me, I'm curious, how was that for you guys coming into 5e and seeing that game system and, and running it? So the simplicity of 5e actually reminded me of the early days of, you know, to me it was, it was almost nostalgic and rather than all the, you know, rules bloat that had come in in three and, uh, mm -hmm. and all the other stuff. It was almost nostalgic to go back to a game that was, in my mind, much simpler uh, and and much more left things in the hands of the game master as opposed to, oh, there's a rule on book forty three in book forty three on page eighty two that says this combination and that combination are perfect together. That sounds like right? a rule master. Like, yeah, you know, it it you know it just it just felt much simpler, right? Yeah. And for me, that was super appealing, right? Uh, and, uh, and so, so what about? Um... Darren, did you did you notice the smoothness difference in terms of the reversed 
armor class and stuff like that? I mean, was the new adoption? I mean, it, it had the nostalgia of the old D and D. It had a, a smooth and elegant math behind it. I think that was similar to you know they brought in some of the same guys from from Magic, who I think also helped work on some of the rule sets. I don't know for sure, but it just seemed That's to evoke the big that same thing for me. Thing. Was it was easy to pick up, you know, having played, you know, you know, advanced D and D. If mm -hmm. anything, there were a few few less few things gone, right? Like, you know, not having a big dungeon master's guide with as much detail for play, which was kind of more in the player's handbook. It was, you know, pretty quick to pick up and I think uh, get started playing. Did you find your play of style had changed from 5e versus the, the old school D&D? &D? I think that that was more due to Maturity. <laughs> Maturity. Yeah. Yeah. I'd see where, where you are in your life. I think more than, more than anything else. Right. I think, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if we were still teenagers, we'd probably play just as badly as we did that in terms of, you know, but yeah, you know, I think the, the one big thing that, you know, was kind of, you know, kind of led us to where we are was just the trying to spend less time, flipping through books and shuffling papers and to be able to really focus on when we're playing, you know, what's happening in the story. How is that going? You know, mm -hmm. how do we interact with each other and, and really, you know, enjoying the storytelling and the kind of human interaction parts of, of what's going and the puzzle solving and those types of things, rather than the, the kind of the, technical you know where am i going to store this thing and how do i remember that and all of those types of details did you find that because um, i know that sometimes when we're teenagers it's all about the combat and proving yourself and stuff like that too did that wash away as well as you as you've grown i think even then we like puzzles and stuff like there were a lot yeah. more puzzles in our games even back then puzzles and traps and you know so forth then okay. but probably a lot less role playing yeah it was a lot more defeat this series of things you know when we solve, were a kid. The, solve the issue right, right yeah exactly it's like you know overcome this trap you know fight this monster you know that sort of stuff the the only the barest thread of a storyline was there but like i think the longest campaign we ran when we were you know like i was the gm we ran all the way through the g series the d series all the way up to q1 right so we ran a lot of other modules like one off occasionally write our own, you know, you know, do whatever. But like, I think of, of the written series, that was by far the longest, longest series we, we, uh, we ran. And, uh, that was a lot of fun though, you know, going from the beginning of that to the end. So, so I think that there's one thing though, is even today, I think compared to some people, we still enjoy a good combat. Yeah, oh yeah. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, that, that, that challenge is always there if it's done right. Right. Yeah. For... My, my wife is like any excuse to, to throw a fireball, right? <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. So it's the family that fireballs together stays together. I see. Yeah. I see. She, she would, you know, just as soon every caster in the group have fireballs. So, that, you know, you just obliviate anything, you know, like don't get in the way barbarian because we're about to, about to destroy all these things. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. From um, your perspective, you started in around 2015, 2016. How long before you started saying, hey, we want a digital solution to this? Late 2018, probably. You were experimenting with character sheets even before then, but before we, the time we started writing code. Talk, talk me through the character sheets. Well, I was mostly trying variety of stuff. So D&D &D Beyond, Fight Club. Mm -hmm. There were probably two or three others that I played with creating characters and trying it and then getting frustrated and mm -hmm. move on to the next thing. So, but I think that by the time we started working on this, I refused to use a, a paper character sheet, even though I was annoyed every time with the tools. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you've been using a paper character or, or a digital character sheet of some kind for probably a year and a half before we actually started writing, writing tools of our own. And it, it, you know, it was, it started out as a very simple problem, right? Which was, I don't want to spend a half hour drawing on a battle map. I want to be able to digitally put a map up and 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 either put our our miniatures on it or tokens of some kind on top, or 
use digital tokens, mm -hmm. one or the other, right? Didn't didn't much matter. And so we started actually like we looked at Roll Twenty and Fantasy Grounds and Ark and Forge and you name it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, else that was around at the time, right? And frankly, all of them were just super clunky, right? For doing for doing something really simple, right? And so we just wrote one, right? Darren so Darren spent of, one weekend writing one. As you know? as the as the ultimate nerd, I'm always have something I would be coding with on the side. So mm -hmm. that became my, oh, let's go try this. And mm -hmm. it kind of, you know, started to mushroom pretty quickly. Yeah, so, so he'd, so, he'd so, code it. The next night we'd play it, you know, and, and then we'd say, okay, it'd be nice if it had this and this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually it was, well, it'd be great if the players could move their own tokens on the board so the game master didn't have to move all the tokens. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to have a device in the co player's hands. Okay, well, if we're going to have a device in the player's hands, might, why not merge that with the character sheet? <laughs> and it just mushroomed from there. <laughs> so features and benefits uh, would all increase as as you got feedback literally in your own games. It, it, initially, yeah. just all in our own games, right? And then when it got to the state where, where you know, we, it had, I don't know, maybe a third of what it's got today, mm -hmm. right? Well, maybe not even that. <laughs> maybe not even that, right? Um uh, the, you know, when it had all the rudimentary pieces working, you know, friends would say, Hey, can we use this tool for our own games? And so we essentially invented a, a you know, a way, a way to, you know, for them to log in and create their own, you know, instance effectively in the cloud. A shard, right. if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and, uh, which, which kind of got started because I was curious and playing around with some of the Google Firebase stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It was the original version was written in Heroku uh, using Firebase as the back end. Right. So like it wow. was written. Uh, so uh, I, circling back to something you said, Darren, you said something about you refuse to play with a, char a paper character sheet. Can you tell me what what caused that for you? Like you wanted to use an electronic character sheet. What was the 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 impetus for that? So my experience with the paper character sheet is that it just becomes a huge distraction from play. Mm -hmm. Trying to, what are my capabilities and what is the value for this? And what are, especially with a spell caster, you know, what are my spells and how many spell slots mm -hmm. and what is the bonus that goes with it? And, you know, flipping through the books to look up information and find that. So being able to have that kind of in one spot where I can kind of quickly look it up and just spend less time with the kind of bookkeeping and more time actually playing was my main goal. So it, it kept the game more gamey as opposed to less of that. But you're, you know, with some VTTs, I find that I'm not playing Dungeons and Dragons. I'm playing, let's build this VTT. <laughs> um, and, you know, not to, to take away from some of those because, you know, they, they created something that's awesome for those groups that did that. And, and some are still around, you know, and they're great. Shard is the, the, kind of the new big kid on the block in many ways and in and, and meaningfully so what what is it that um, I mean did you guys ever decide hey we wanted to make sure this was going to flow smoothly or is that is that part of your process or always has been right if it's not easy if it's not easier to do in the tool then 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 it's not worth doing right like so the, it has to be easy and one of the reasons we embraced 5e as a system is not just because that's the dominant system we play with right and that kind of stuff i mean originally it was that but it was also so one of the reasons that the systems you're talking about are so hard to use mm -hmm. is because they try to be system agnostic they mm -hmm. try to not encode any of the behavior of the system into their base primitives so basically they rely on somebody to write scripts on top mm -hmm. that that you know do the do the do the basically implement even basic primitives of the game Mm -hmm. Things like rolling with advantage or adding a modifier or whatever else are all script written on top of their platform, not actually the code in the platform itself doesn't understand any of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so when we set out to do the character sheet, it was like, no, we're going to code a 5e character sheet from the ground up that actually understands the mechanics of proficiency and understands the, the you know, what modifier to add to this role or that role mm -hmm. and you know all that sort of stuff and like it it just it made everything simpler right to, to have you know one core mechanic and 
even now, like as we embrace more publishers that each have, you know, their own kind of variation of 5e rules, it, it turns out to be super simple to adapt it to, to, you know, extensions like Cthulhu, right. And so mm -hmm. forth. It has a separate mechanic mechanic for insanity and dread and formula casting and those things. And those kinds of extensions were just adding on top of the core, core thing. And like, we never ask a user to write any code. <laughs> like there's never wow. a point the user writes any code. <laughs> wow, that sounds really nice. Um, yeah. I did have a question here uh, from the, the 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 folks in in chat here. Uh, question: I'm liking what I see of Shard so far. What was your design philosophy when designing Shard, considering the existence of other VTD options like Foundry and Roll Twenty? Hmm. Okay. So the first principle was we didn't want you to ever have to set up any software. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you, it had to be as simple as type a URL and start. Right. So there was mm -hmm. never, you were never going to not install a piece of software and you were never going to write any software in order to play the game. Mm -hmm. right? Second, second principle is it had to work on every device because we wanted to be able to set around, you know, at the time we were playing in person and as a, as the game master, I was using a PC, but like most of the players had their phones in their hands or a tablet. Mm -hmm. Right. So it had to work on every device. Right. If it, if it required separate programming for different devices, then we knew we were down the, and we'd done this many times with commercial software. Anytime somebody says, oh yeah, I'm gonna do a version for the PC and a different version for uh, the phone, you know you're in feature hell, like you're never gonna catch up, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of one will always be ahead of the other. Feature you know. hell, I love yeah. that. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that for, for other things in my life. Right, that's exactly right. So it had to be one, piece of code that would run on all the devices, right? Mm -hmm. And that sort of stuff. And so, you know, Darren was already playing with Firebase as a storage thing. It happens to support some really interesting uh, primitives for things like caching and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So like, it's super fast, it can run offline. We experimented with a couple of different web frameworks. He can walk you through that process to what he eventually chose uh, on that front. And like, you know, it just had to be, so that's like the technology primitives. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it was, it had to be simple. Like it usually, it had to be easier for somebody to use, certainly easier than paper and pencil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like it had, it just had to be easier than that, right? Uh, for the player, right? Um, and it had to be intuitive enough that a new player could sit down and learn it in a very quick period of time, right? If it, if we ever find something like, we take feedback from our, from our Discord and Facebook user groups all the time about, you know, when somebody says, well, how do I, and we went, well, here's how you do it, but how would you have preferred it happen? Right? Mm -hmm. like more than what, one way to do the same task? Yeah, what, 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 like what would have been more intuitive for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like what would have been, you know, better? Uh, had we done it this way, would it have been better, right? And a lot of the, you know, enhancements you've seen to the character sheet and to other things, like we've been, you know, obviously with the launch of the marketplace yesterday, we've been super busy you know, getting all the content, new content creators on board and on both on content creation features and on uh, marketplace features over the last, say, couple months, mm -hmm. right? Is, that's been the top priority, right, to get things launched. And now we've got a nice backlog of things that are like, okay, enhancements to the player features that, you know, have been contributed by our community over the last, I don't know, two, two months, three months, or whatever else that literally today we're sitting down going, okay, I really don't like the way this looks. Let's fix this, right? Okay, we're going to change some of the navigation on the character sheet to be easier to get between different parts. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to display, you know, things in a different way here to make it more intuitive, right? And so we're just continually refining like that. There's been some things, you know, in terms of kind of keeping the tool out of the way, like where you get some intersection with technology. So. Mm -hmm. One of the things we wanted was whatever we did, we wanted it to be very responsive. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to have these kind of delays between I do this and then I wait and then it comes back and then I do my next thing. So we, as a result, kind of hit the in-between of creating a real app and having it be um, a web application mm -hmm. in that almost all the code runs offline and on the client rather than at the server. And it's only really small amounts of data that go back and forth. So as a result, we can keep the user experience very snappy and very quick to get things done without having these kind of 
latency delays where I'm going back and forth to the to the web or the internet to try to do stuff. So so dice rolling is done at the client, but results eventually go back as needed if it's sure. going to create a permanent change. But if it's just something that's temporary, it's not something you'd leave there, right? Yeah, yeah the die roll go, gets executed on the client and goes into the into the dice tray locally, and then it gets communicated a shared state to the rest of the players that are a part of that game so they know the number but they didn't have to do the number crunching to watch the die roll very good right. yeah okay yeah they actually get the string that says you know you got a, a d8 that was a five plus uh you know whatever the modifier was and it displays right and so it re-renders on their side right so it wasn't none of it was ever server side rendered another awesome. thing that that i think has been big with as we we're doing content and content creation is we wanted to have a system where all of the kind of core classes, races, abilities are done through a generic modeling. So you don't mm -hmm. have to write code, but that you can do everything. And that we have pretty much held true to not having back doors to make things happen. So if we go to implement a new class feature or a race feature and it's not currently supported, we don't go build a, a special implementation. We figure out how we can model that generically. And then we build that feature. And then we go build the, the race or the class or whatever using that. So as a result, the, the set of things that you can do has, has grown as we've continued to expand and as we continue to move forward with other stuff. But it means that you can go and create all sorts of interesting combinations that go well beyond what we initially came up with. Yeah. So, for example, uh, spell casting is a great example of that, right? So you you have a few different spell casting. Like in in fifth edition, you have full casters, half casters, third casters, uh, uh, and literally on the modeling dialog for class, if you're creating a new class that wants to be a spell caster. It says choose are you a full caster half caster and it like assigns spell slots accordingly so it maintains that balance built maintains the, system the, the game balance yeah. right and, and that sort of stuff so it basically do, does that it also understands pack magic so you can assign a pack magic feature in fact one of the features on the board right now we're getting ready to do is the is the half pack magic because there's one of the blood hunter classes that's not an official class but people love it so we're we're modeling uh you know half packed magic uh mm -hmm. as a as a feature for one of the subclasses of blood hunter right uh you know where you get half the number of slots you would if you were a full warlock and as, <laughs> that one of the ones we we're talking about earlier today right is, is the fact that okay so what if i multi-class from blood from uh from warlock to to blood hunter or uh, vice versa well how many pack slots do i get well you get half your blood hunter level plus your plus your because it's a half warlock right so like multi-classing basically naturally just understands how to make it happen. It's, right? it's, it sounds like a lot of math. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. The core game is a lot of math, but it's not. it turns out to be no math that the user has to do. The engine kind of understands what a half caster is, mm -hmm. right? It understands what half pack magic it is. It understands what, what you know, that sort of stuff is, and right? And you it, build it. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, now that you're you're up and running, you just got your shop up and running. Mm -hmm. are, are you guys running on, you know, full, all, all eight cylinders and, and looking to buy a V12 and, and make it even <laughs> beefier? What, what, are you, what are you guys looking at in terms of Shard is here and there's no way that Shard's not going to be here for a while because, it, you know, you guys have already a massive amount of support from all these third party groups that are putting out content and they're putting yep. it ready to go for your platform. Yep what's 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 the next thing that you guys i mean like are you guys able to keep up with all this yeah um, yeah you know you yeah, guys I mean, just yeah, crack your knuckles and you, you spend a weekend and you've got the next three months done or i mean like how does that work for you guys not not quite <laughs> you know this is this is both our full-time gig now so we're both sort of retired from any other commercial gig like mm -hmm. you know we do a few board you know sit on a few boards and do a few commercial things but this is our almost full-time retirement gig now mm -hmm. uh and uh and so it's not just a weekend job uh and there you know particularly when it comes to content conversion and working with the other creators there's a staff beyond us that that helps with that sort of stuff right mm -hmm. uh and uh and so you know last week i sat down and you know converted this thing 
over, you know, oh, yeah, 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 over, over, and you saw it in the, uh, in the marketplace Monday. And that literally, I got the, I got the, the contents of that book in a digital format on Thursday and it was ready for the market on Monday. Wow. You know, so um, you guys are putting it out there. Yeah. And so, and don't forget, I, I you, you might want to mention the most important person in your life, Hal, that helps with that. What's <laughs> yeah, my name? daughter is like literally the one that runs all the conversions and she got a nice surprise yesterday and that, you know, one of the upcoming books that we're converting that's going to press uh, simultaneously, we're going to release the shard version for Cobalt Press. Her name is actually in the book. Oh. Right. And, and, and so she was like, you know, bouncing off the walls yesterday, excited about the fact that Cobalt Press loved her enough with the work she's doing for them to actually put her name in the book. <laughs> oh, that's so wonderful. And, and, I, and it's, you know, she's one of these super detail oriented people that like she literally, you know, as we were converting some of their old books would generate, you know, two or three pages of, of uh, you know, errors and omissions mm -hmm. that she found as she was converting it and going, OK. And like they just hired a new new uh, managing editor there. And Thomas has been great. He like takes her feedback and turns it around and goes, OK, here's what we want to do to fix each one of these things up. Right. And and uh, works with the designers and all that sort of stuff. So she's literally become a, a member of the Cobalt Press team. That's awesome that, that the integration yeah. is that tight and the transparency is that clean. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, we 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 strive. I mean, like we have especially with the, you know, even, even some small publishers, right. That have pushed us have been great, right. To work with in terms of they, you know, we, we've been working closely with, you know, our very first content partner was our underground Oracle and it's literally a, you know, two person team that's cranking out who those folks are, yeah. for 5e, right. And uh, they do amazing stuff. You know, Jess and Keith are awesome. Mm -hmm. And so we've worked closely with them for what, oh, uh, almost a year now. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's uh, and uh, and and you know they helped organize some of the first public playtest games for the for for us and you know, all that sort of stuff there, you know. So yeah, we're pretty tight with our content community, and that's one of the reasons we have no trouble recruiting new ones, right? It's like, you know, they they get just how much we care about them being successful on our platform. Is that a big part of the philosophy that you guys have? Is it's 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 not just because you're trying to put something together and and generate a cash flow. It's it's because you actually care about the games and the people behind them. Yeah, this is like compared to you know working at a career at Microsoft or something something like that. This is probably never generate the kind of money that we you know we did in the prime of our careers and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, right? It's never been about the money. It's about the love of the game and it's about seeing seeing this community, you know. Uh, create like we literally, you know, uh, you know, have pricing that like it's you know for our cheapest subscription is like twenty bucks a year, right? Mm -hmm. And includes a whole bunch of content that we're, you know, both some stuff we created and some stuff we're licensing, mm -hmm. right? And that sort of stuff. It's not a skew that's going to make a ton of money for us, but it mm -hmm. provides a whole bunch of uh, value to the user, right? And uh, and that sort of stuff. So it's like you know we. Our goal is to is to grow a community, not to try to make a bunch of money. Did your release and and um, publication of your system get accelerated because of the pandemic? Did that did that help launch it in a meaningful? I mean, like everybody's playing remotely now. I can't think of a, a better time to launch a remote gameplay system. I, I, so it didn't figure into how we thought about the timeline for what we were doing, but it but it but it did. I think, you know, we did, you know, like when we took it live May 1st of last year in the, you know, in the initial beta version, you know, live around that time, we were shocked how many people jumped on it, like mm -hmm. immediately, right? And like with almost no advertising, just all word of mouth, right? There were, you know, thousands of people, right? Uh, you know, by the time we, we, you know, kicked off the Kickstarter this January, there were, you know, well over 10,000 people. And today there are well over 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. Right. That are, that are, you know, and it's almost all word of mouth. Like we, we did, you know, late last fall uh, in prep for the commercial launch, we did, you know, a small amount of Facebook and search advertising, but like, like <laughs> small, right. Like don't think, you know, not even, not even tens of thousands of dollars, like that, you know, barely thousands of dollars mm -hmm. have, have been spent. Right. Single digit so. dollars a day. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Yeah. Uh, and 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 I'm familiar yeah. with Facebook Pixel. I've had to I've had to leverage that in the past before. So yeah, we don't even, we don't actually don't we we're, we're we don't even leverage that right. Yeah. None of the, the we we uh, uh, because we refuse to track and invade people's privacy. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that sort of stuff. So we don't even we didn't even install the pixel on our site or in the app or anything mm-hmm. else. It's like it's it's 100 percent just, you know, we targeted the U.S. role playing audience and uh, and that sort of stuff. And that's been the other thing is like, oh, how would you do that without without pixel? Uh, that's interesting. We'll have to talk offline about that. Sometime. Facebook targets it themselves within the contents of their own site. OK. So, OK. Um, so. you, you guys are teaching me something new here. Yeah. You don't have to have the pixel to do that. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's there's because um, they know like what your expressed interests are if you're part of an RPG group or whatever else. That's the way it works. I, but yeah, it's. Um, I'd like to, you to hear something from Chad. It's like uh, they definitely get that this uh, that this is our passion vibe from you guys, and they think it's very cool. Cool. So. Yeah. Yeah. It is All right. It's, this is, you know, it's it makes me extremely happy when a new content creator reaches out and says, "Hey, you know, I." I've been, you know, I've got this one thing, you know, like whether they're, you know, obviously, you know, the big creators are market makers, like mm-hmm. somebody like Cobalt Press or Peterson Games or Nor, these guys, these are market makers, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they can drive hundreds of users to us, but it makes me just as happy when some guy that's published his very first module, like, uh, you know, reaches out. Like one of the things I'm happiest about in our Kickstarter, we funded um, the guy that, uh, that moderates our discord wrote his very first module and he did a great, I mean, a great job. It's got fantastic art. It's really well written and all that kind of stuff. And we funded that module and paid him to, to have it be a reward for all our Kickstarter. So now there's oh, wow. you know, hundreds of people that have that module in their hands and he's selling units every day now in the marketplace and he's ecstatic about it. Right. And he's a first time creator, right. He never, never written anything before. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the, those kinds of stories make me just as happy as, you know, working with Cobalt Press or Nord or the other guys. Yeah, this is one of the things I think that, you know, from a creator point of view is trying to give great tools for all of the amazing third party producers out there that that are doing stuff, right? It's, you know, the, you know, Wizards of the Coast gets a lot of special treatment just because they're so big. Mm -hmm. And as a result, not everyone gets the same treatment, especially with kind of some of the other marketplaces and that Mm -hmm. type of stuff. So, you know, our, us being able to help that community be successful is actually really important to us, right? Which is why, you know, we don't have any exclusive, you know, listings with us and we want people to be as successful as they can. And Yeah. Yeah. Not only we, do we not have anything like, like an exclusive listing, like we don't, we, we, we never sort of incense somebody in a way that says, Oh, we'll you know give you a bigger share of the revenue or lower our marketplace fee if you don't list it anyplace else. Or, you know, like there's none of that going on. It's like mm-hmm. we we charge a fair price for what we what, what service we provide is in the market, and that kind of stuff. And we want you to keep as much of the money and reinvest it in your products or you know feed your family or whatever you're trying to do with. Put with more the, on shard so that more people want to use it. That's a win for everyone, right? Yeah, more. I mean, like we know mm-hmm. that hey, great tools only go so far. Great content is what carries the game forward, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and and so, you know, uh, look, we're trying. Our goal was to save every game master a lot of time and get more people playing the game. Mm-hmm. Well, having a great set of prepackaged content is one way to do that, right? So if I can sit down and, you know, play a one shot that's like incredibly well written and, and and great art, or I can start a new campaign as big as Empire of Ghouls. And have literally hundreds of mar- monster tokens and and all the maps laid out and literally it's click on an encounter and activate it. You mm-hmm. know, uh, if all that can just happen, like then the game masters, you know, basically they have to know the premise of the game and a few key facts and they can jump in and and run the game. Yeah, wow. it is. That is one of the feedback I I love seeing in our various places. Is I've never DM'd before and I tried it and it went great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So the, and on the tool too, because that, right. that can be a yeah, challenge exactly. with that. So yeah. Some of them are I've never run, a, I'd never used an online tool, or I'd tried another tool and failed, or whatever else. But some of them are literally I'd never tried to be a game master before, right? Mm-hmm. I'd never sat down and done it, and I got so confident with your tool as a player that I thought, well, I can do this, right? And and they were successful, and they did it, right? And uh, and and that sort of stuff, and then. You know, the other ones we get notes, you know, you talk about pandemic or people are like, 
you know, you guys saved my, my game. I had, you know, I, like I had three games that had been on hiatus for, you know, an indefinite period of time until I discovered your tool. And it was just so easy that we're all up and running now. Like all three games are back. Right. And, you know, that sort of stuff. Like, you know, I that. think that that was the biggest thing that the pandemic shifted for us was to understand the online centric play mm -hmm. as much as the in-person because a lot of shards started out our assumption was that you would mostly use it in person to play because that's what you were doing at the time yeah you yeah. know and you know we would you know put put it on the the tv and we would sit down and you know use that as our virtual game board or mm -hmm. sit around the table doing it and you know there were a bunch of things that we learned you know mostly by listening to feedback from other people about what what we needed with it and that mm -hmm. you know one of the things that when we first started out is we didn't really care for digital dice because we were playing in person you know those physical dice were part of the the, the game flow but once you're playing online remote it, it has a different uh, a different feel to it and you know someone gave us you know great feedback they're like look you know i can roll the dice i can tell you what i rolled but it's just a lot nicer to be able to see what people are rolling as they're rolling. And that mm -hmm. was, you know, uh, a big light switch for us to go and, Hey, we need to have digital dice. And, and we went and used that to, you know, pivot and, and change it. And we've gotten a lot of feedback from people about what's working, what's not working. And, you know, that I think is, you know, a lot of the, where shard has gotten isn't just you know we made some brilliant decision it was you know listening to people giving us feedback and saying hey it would be nice if it did this or why is this this way and you know trying to you know learn from that how does that feedback loop work now do people just email it in or do they click a button say please add feature or uh, we've got a wish list on our Discord server that, like, you know, you can go, go up and put anything you want on the wish list. And, like, if we don't understand what it is, I'll, I'll, one of us will jump on and ask questions about, okay, what, what did you mean? How would this be better? Mm -hmm. You know, all that sort of stuff. Or one of the moderators or other members of the community will say, hey, you know, we, th we think about it this way. And when they kind of done, done that, we, we harvest the best stuff off that list and, and put it into the tool. So you have never been... really just one thing, right? Like, we watch all of our channels, Facebook, Reddit, Discord, emails. And some of it is, you know, we get wish list. Hey, I wish it would do this. Some of it is just, I can't figure out how to do this. Or how does this work? Or, you know, can you do this? Right. And, you know, just engaging with people to try and figure it out. And, you know, one of the things that we really try to do with that that's nice through these kind of real-time communications is it's not just, hey, I'd like feature X, mm -hmm. but we can turn around and say, hey, what are you doing with that? Why do you want that? And when we can like figure out how to build it in a way that's gonna integrate and go with it. And, you know, sometimes we do exactly what people asked for. In other cases, we kind of dig a couple levels deep and figure out, oh yeah, we really need to solve this kind of more fundamental thing instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, this has been a very enriching conversation for me and for the audience. I know that 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 I'm excited to uh, get to know you guys a lot better and and see so much more about what your philosophy was behind this, and, and as well as the human beings that are real and and and, and flesh and blood that that make this this possible. And I know that there are thousands of people now who are thankful for the work that you've put in. Um, if you guys get a chance, um, we're going to, we're going to do our quick little drawing. If you could hang on for just a moment, we're going to pick our winner for their contest. And from there, all right, Dura, Bora, whoops. And Wizard of DC have both won, uh, the contest. We'll reach out to both of you guys here shortly. Uh, congratulations on winning the, the giveaway from Overhead Games. Gentlemen, thank you again so much for coming out. Um, if there's anything we can do for you, we're, we'd love to talk with you some more. Um, and everyone else, you'll see this one on YouTube in about 48 hours, and then a separate interview will be edited out just for that uh, a few, uh, within a day or two after that as well. Be sure and check us out next week on the Games Tavern Happy Hour at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. 
And then also check us out tomorrow as the Velcan Weave starts their live uh, action role play as well. So see you guys soon. See you guys next week. Thanks, John. No problem. Thanks a lot.